Welcome to this lecture. This is the fifth lecture of week 4. In the previous lectures, we have started discussing about almost sure convergence of independent random variables. So, in particular, we have talked about the convergence of the sequence of partial sums and we have also looked at two important inequalities namely the Kolmogorov's inequality and the Etemadi's inequality. And then using these inequalities, we have tried to extract information or equivalent conditions for the convergence of the original series of random variables. Before that, we had also looked at certain real analytic methods for claiming the convergence of such random series. But now, we are focusing purely on probabilistic methods and here our main assumption that we are going to follow is that we are working with a sequence of random variables which are independent and we are interested in the almost sure convergence of such a series. So, without further delay, let us uh, continue discussing with the slides. So, again just to set up the notations, we are working with a specific probability space and on this probability space, we are given a sequence of random variables all of which are known to be independent. Uh, we are now interested in the almost sure convergence of this series. Now, as discussed earlier, we can discuss this convergence through the sequence of partial sums, where these random variables S n are nothing but the sum of first n many random variables meaning x 1 up to x n the addition of these quantities. So, that gives us this sequence of partial sums and as long as this sequence of partial sums converge, we end up having the convergence of the random series. But now, our main interest is to look at these probabilistic techniques, where we are assuming that the random variables x n are given to be independent. Now, here we look at this interesting quantity that this is the specific event or the collection of sample points where the convergence happens. So, this is our quantity of interest. Now, note that this event that we are looking at, it is actually in the sigma field generated by all these random variables x 1, x 2 and so on. So, just to recall the definition of the sigma field generated by these random variables, all we are doing is first looking at all possible Borel subsets of the real line and then for all such random variables meaning for all j from 1, 2 and so on, we are looking at the pre images of the Borel set. So, look at that collection and look at the sigma field generated by that whole collection. So, that is the sigma field generated by all these random variables and it is clear immediately that the set in question or the event in question where the point wise convergence for the series holds that event must be contained in this sigma field. But now note that whenever we are talking about a convergence of a series, we can ignore the first few terms. right? So, let us say I ignore the value of the first random variable. So, the convergence of the series can be thought of as convergence of the series, but excluding the first term. But this does not change the nature of the convergence and therefore, this is again a equivalent description of the same event that we are interested in. But note however, that this description which now involves the random variables from x 2 onwards. So, we are simply not looking at the original random variable x 1 to start off with. So, therefore, the new description of this event that we are concerned with actually is also in the sigma field generated by x 2, x 3 and so on, but we can exclude x 1 from this collection. So, using this observation more generally we can continue like this and ignore the first few random variables. So, let us go on and see what happens with that observation. So, what we are saying is that, so if we skip first n minus 1 many random variables, then still the description of the convergence does not change and therefore, the set still belongs to this specific sigma field and this happens for all n. But now, since A belongs to these sigma fields for all n, therefore, A must belong to the intersection of all these sigma fields. So, the nth sigma field that we are looking at 
is generated by the random variables x n, x n plus 1 and so on. So, we are skipping the first few random variables and then we are generating the sigma fields and looking at the full intersection of that. But now remember intersection of sigma fields is also a sigma field. So, this is a interesting sigma field that we have ended up with and the event of interest where the pointwise convergence holds that is inside this specific sigma field. So, let us now look at this specific structure of the sigma field that we have constructed. So, we make it a definition and we call it the tail sigma field. We are now going to def make this definition for a general sequence of random variables and not necessarily for independent random variables. So, in particular for independent random variables also we can look at this description, but we can also make this definition for any sequence of random variables. So, just to avoid any confusion, we now look at a general sequence of random variables not necessarily independent and call them as y n. And then we look at the sigma field generated by y n, y n plus 1 and so on. So, that is a specific sigma field for fixed value of n and then finally, we look at the intersection of all of these which by construction becomes another sigma field. And this is the sigma field that we are going to call as the tail sigma field associated with the sequence y n. But corresponding to this definition, we can also make a slightly parallel definition, but this is only involving certain sequence of events. So, previously what we are considering is a general sequence of random variables and from that we are cooking up this sigma field. But now we are starting off with a sequence of events coming from our sigma field and generating a specific sub sigma field. So, what we do is that for fixed n, we are now going to look at the sigma field generated by the sets a n, a n plus 1 and so on. So, and then for all n, we are going to look at that intersection. So, that is forming a new sigma field and that is what we are going to refer to as the tail sigma field associated with the sequence of events a n. But now, as you might expect that these two definitions of tail sigma fields, one corresponding to random variables and another corresponding to events, they have slight relations between themselves and that is what is described in exercise number 5. So, please work this out. So, the idea is like this. So, if I give you a sequence a n of events, then we can construct a sequence of random variables y n this way by simply looking at the indicator of the corresponding sets. Now, you see the y n s are actually 0 1 valued random variables and here what happens is that you can look at the tail sigma field generated by the sequence of random variables y n and you can also look at the tail sigma field generated by the sequence of events a n. And in each case what you can show is that both the tail sigma fields match and that actually follows because for all n if you generate the sigma field with only a n, a n plus 1 and so on that matches with the sigma field generated by y n, y n plus 1 and so on. So, if this happens at the every level n and therefore, it will also happen for the complete intersection. So, that is how this exercise will follow. Please try to work this out and this links the tail sigma fields concepts for the general sequence of random variables with those of that of the events. All right. So, we are now going to use this structure of the tail sigma fields to make some interesting comments, but before we go into the tail sigma fields, we make a very nice interesting observation. It is this that if A is some event such that it is independent of itself, then using this fact what we can do use the property of independence and observe the relation that A can be identified as A intersection A. So, that is a nice identity, but appealing to the independence of events what we will get is that the probability of A is equal to probability of A intersection A and here we will use the fact that A is independent of itself. So, we will end up with the product of the probabilities of A and that is what this relation is all about. But then this relation immediately tells you that probability of A must be 0 or 1. Now, what we are going to discuss in the later part of this lecture is to look at certain properties of events 
where the probabilities are exactly 0 or 1 and these kind of results are typically referred to as the 0 or 1 laws. Remember earlier that the Borel Cantilly lemma that we had discussed that in fact is a result of this type where you get certain specific type of sets with probability either 0 or 1. So, that was the description of the Borel Cantilly lemma that you should recall and if you do not recall it please go back and check it. So, here also we are going to look at certain general techniques that will tell us when the probability of certain events are 0 or 1. And in this direction the important result that we are going to look at is this that if you have a sequence of events which are given to be independent then for any set coming from the tail sigma field associated with this sequence of independent events we must have the probability of any such set is either 0 or 1. So, this is again a result that tells you that the probability of A must be 0 or 1. So, let us see how we can prove such a result and here we shall see that the independence of the events in question plays a very very crucial role. Now, note that we are starting off with any arbitrary set capital A coming from the tail sigma field associated with this sequence of events. Now, if you fix any positive integer n, then look at the fact that by the assumption of independence, the first n minus 1 many events and the rest of the events, these two collections are independent. And hence, what we can show immediately is that the sigma field generated by the first n minus 1 events and the sigma field generated by the remaining events starting with a n, a n plus 1 and so on, these two sigma fields must be independent. Now, sigma fields are independent, this formulation is simply that you take a event from the first sigma field, you take another event from the second sigma field and these two arbitrary events must be independent. So, that is the concept of independence of two collections of events. So, we continue with that description and let us see what we can find. Here you note that the event A that is in the intersection of all these sigma fields, it is in the tail sigma field. So, therefore, in particular for every fixed value of n, the event A must be in particular in the sigma field generated by a n, a n plus 1 and so on. But then this tells you that this event capital A must be independent of the other sigma field which is generated by the first n minus 1 events. In particular, this tells you that the events A and then A 1 up to A n minus 1, they must be independent. But then this here we have assumed n to be any arbitrary positive integer and varying the n what we can get is that the full sequence A 1 A 2 A n together with the new set capital A must be independent. This follows because each finite sub collection of this big collection that we have now constructed are independent. That follows because each finite sub collection of A A 1 A 2 and so on must be contained in some A A 1 A 2 A n minus 1 for some large value of n. And hence this since this is a finite sub collection of certain independent collection of events you must have the independence of any finite sub collection of A A 1 A 2 A n and so on. And therefore, the full collection is independent. Here we are going back to the notion of independence of a arbitrary collection of events and that requires the independence of finitely many of the events, but considering all such finite sub collections. And that is what we have been able to establish. So, therefore, what we have is that the original sequence A 1 A 2 A n together with the new set capital A forms a independent collection of events. But then a consequence of that will tell you that A must be independent of this remaining sets coming from the general sequence that we are looking at. And therefore, if I now take any set B coming from by this sigma field generated by the whole sequence that must be independent with A. But now, A is also inside the sigma field because first of all it is in the tail sigma field and then the tail sigma field is a sub collection of the grand sigma field generated by the complete sequence of events A 1, A 2, A n and so on. And therefore, since A is itself in the grand sigma field, A must be independent of itself. 
So, that is the observation that we have ended up with by using our logic and therefore, since A is independent of itself by our earlier observation that we made in node 10, we must have the probability of A must be 0 or 1. So, that gives you the result that we have claimed that if I take a sequence of independent events, then look at the tail sigma field and then any set coming from the tail sigma field must have probability either 0 or 1. We can now extend this results to random variables and that result leads us to this important theorem which we refer to as the Kolmogorov 0 1 law. So, here what we assume is that we are now given a sequence of random variables denoted by x n and they are assumed to be independent, but now we are going to look at any tail event meaning coming from the tail sigma field generated by x 1, x 2 and so on. So, if you take any such event then the claim is that the probability must be 0 or 1. So, to prove this result we make two claims and these two claims will in turn give us the result in the statement. So, to start off with we look at this collection of events. So, for a v positive integer n we look at the sigma field generated by x 1 up to x n and take the union of all these sigma fields, but in general union of sigma fields need not be a sigma field. So, for the moment we are interested in this collection of events which we denoted by g. So, here we are going to claim that this collection g that we have constructed is actually a field on the set omega, meaning it is a sub collection of subsets of events in omega which forms a field and moreover this field if you generate the sigma field with it that will match with the sigma field generated by the all these random variables x 1, x 2 and so on. So, that is the first claim, but now the second claim states that take any tail event meaning any event coming from the tail sigma field associated with the sequence x 1, x 2 and so on. Then the claim is that A and the field G must be independent. This means that if you pick up any subset from the collection G, then A and B must be independent. So, that is the notion of independence of a set with a sigma field. All right. So, let us try to see how these two claims helps us prove the result. So, here what we do is that we start with the claim 2. So, here what happens is that if I pick up any tail event meaning any event capital A coming from the tail sigma field associated with the sequence x 1, x 2 and so on, then by claim 2 A and the field G must be independent, but the field G generates the sigma field generated by all the random variables x 1, x 2 and so on. So, therefore, it in particular tells you that A and sigma of G must be independent in the sense that if you pick up any event B coming from this sigma field, then A and B must be independent, but we observe this fact that since A is in the tail sigma field, it is also in the sigma field generated by the general sequence of random variables and therefore, A is actually also in the sigma field generated by the field G and therefore, A is inside the collection sigma field generated by script G and therefore, A must be independent of itself and hence again we go back to the earlier observation in note 10 that will tell you that since A is independent of itself, then the probability of A must be 0 or 1. And there what happens is this that we have essentially managed to generalize the previous theorem that was for a sequence of independent events to the sequence of independent random variables. So, that is the result that is uh, essentially being claimed by the Kolmogorov 0 1 law, but now we have proved this result, but we are yet to prove the two claims that we have made. So, as long as we prove these two claims we will complete the argument. So, let us see one by one. So, let us start with the claim 1. So, here we are looking at this collection script G and we want to show that this collection script G forms a field on omega. To start off with since script G is actually union of certain sigma fields, it automatically contains the whole set which is the big omega set. But now we want to show that 
if I take any two sets coming from G, then their union is also there and the complementation is there. So, meaning that G must be closed under finite unions as well as closed under complementation. So, this is the property of a field and this is what we want to establish for the collection script G. Now, let us start with these two any arbitrary sets coming from the script G. Now, note that since the sigma field generated by x 1 up to x n increases with n to the complete union. So, that essentially tells you that there exists some large enough n where both the a 1 and a 2 these two specific sets that we are using here must be in such sigma field generated by some x 1 x 2 x n. This requires some large enough n, but we can always get such an n because script G is the union of this kind of sigma fields. So, that is the description of our collection script G and therefore, if we choose such a large enough n there by using the properties of the sigma field structure of this, we will claim that the union is there as well as the complementation is there. But then since by definition G contains this specific sigma field generated by the first n many random variables. So, therefore, the union is also in G as well as the complementation is always in G. So, therefore, it tells you that the collection script G is actually a field, but we want to also show that the field G generates the sigma field generated by all these random variables x 1, x 2, x n and so on. So, to show this what we observe first is that each random variable is measurable with respect to this sigma field which is generated by the first n many random variables. In particular this sigma field contains all the pre images under the mapping x n and therefore, x n must be measurable. But then x n is also therefore, measurable with respect to the sigma field generated by script g because script g contains the sigma field generated by x 1, x 2, x n and therefore, the sigma field generated by script g also contains this sigma field. So, in particular it contains all the pre images under the mapping x n and therefore, x n must be measurable with sigma of g. But then what we ha have as a consequence is that since each x n is measurable with respect to sigma of g therefore, the sigma field generated by x 1, x 2, x n and so on must be contained in the sigma field generated by g. But by original definition the field is actually contained in the sigma field generated by all these random variables and therefore, the sigma field generated by g that also must be contained in the sigma field generated by x 1, x 2, x n and so on. But we have managed to show both side inclusions and hence we end up with the exact equality that is as per the claim. So, this proves claim 1 of the statement that we made, but now we want to show the claim 2. So, here what we observe that we are given these random variables x 1 up to x n minus 1. So, the first n minus 1 n random variables and the remaining ones they are independent of each other. So, these two are two independent collections of random variables. Now, we note that if if you take these two sets a and b where b is coming from the sigma field generated by the first n minus 1 many random variables then a and b must be independent. Here we are using this important fact that since a is in the tail sigma field then it is also in the sigma field generated by x n, x n plus 1 and so on for all n. So, therefore, since x 1 up to x n minus 1 the first collection of random variables is independent of the remaining random variables. So, therefore, a and b must be independent when b is coming from the sigma field generated by, by the first n minus 1 many random variables. So, therefore, if we make this observation that such a and b are independent, then a is actually independent for all b coming from the first n minus 1 many, but this also is true for any arbitrary n and therefore, as a consequence a is independent of the union of all these sigma fields which is actually g. So, therefore, we have managed to prove the claim that a is actually independent of this field g. This proves claim 2 and therefore, we have proved all the parts of the proof in the Kolmogorov 0 1 law. So, by claim 1 and claim 2 we have already earlier established 
that the theorem follows. This completes the argument. Now, as a consequence of this result, we are going to observe this very, very important fact that if we go back to this theorem 9, which is Kolmogorov 0 1 law and we also go back to another fact that the points where the convergence happens for the series that is actually is in the tail sigma field, then combining these two facts, we end up with this important uh, observation that we start with a sequence of independent random variables and look at the event where the convergence happens, the point wise convergence for the series happens. Then since this is in the tail sigma field, the probability of that must be 0 or 1. So, therefore, in this lecture what we have looked at are certain specific probabilistic methods that ensures looking at the specific type of structures of point wise convergence or almost sure convergence of a series of random variables. And we have managed to figure out that either the sequence of independent random variables that we are looking at the corresponding series either it will converge with probability 1 or will not converge with full probability. So, that is the essence of the result of Kolmogorov 0 1 law that we are applying here. So, consequently what we are looking at are the fact that together with independence it is a boundary kind of a behavior that either the corresponding series always converges or always does not converge. So, this happens with full probability. Now, from the discussions in the next week that we are going to look at will be that under what additional conditions meaning on top of independent sequences of random variables, we will assume some additional conditions which will ensure the convergence and those conditions will actually force the set of uh, points or the events where the convergence happens must end up with full probability. So, as long as you manage to show that such an event has positive probability, then it must have the full measure or full probability. So, essentially we are going to look at certain specific criteria that will help us establish those facts. So, we stop here. Thank you.